All right, so this chapter is just going to look at some general terminology as it relates to uh, as it relates to functional anatomy. So this kind of starts to talk about and make you aware of some ways you would communicate different types of anatomical movements in the body. So this is certainly pertinent to obviously everybody in the course from a from a practical perspective. So be you know obviously the the bulk of this course is going to focus on the different body part regions and the muscle origin insertion actions along with the important bony and skeletal landmarks. But for the purposes of this talk it's going to strictly just be some uh, terminology and some movement description information. So we first kind of look at just again we, the the focus of this chapter is going to be on just like again general terminology as far as movement. And this is stuff you're always going to to need and require. So if you notice in the syllabus every exam always includes this chapter because it's important that you're aware of just kind of general knowledge description. So here we look at some pictures of regions in the body. These are the same illustrations that are in your textbook. So if you look at the various regions of the body, so when you're talking, you know, kind of general, looking at the different body part areas, this is usually how you describe it. And if you notice, um, obviously the, the name of the general region typically pertains to an important landmark area uh, within that, that body part region. So for instance, when you, you look at the wrist region, it's called the carpal region, because that's where the carpal bones are, okay? You have the cranial region, which is referring to the, the skull, the cervical region, which refers to the cervical spine, so on and so forth. So I just want you to note the, the different names of these different uh, regions of the body so that you're able to be able to identify and understand what, what area they're referring to. Plus, as I discuss in other lectures and in class, I'm going to be, you know, using this terminology as well. So, you know, make sure you're, you're aware as you're kind of looking at all these in uh, both in here and in your textbook. Okay, so some other things we look at when we're describing movement, we often refer to planes of movement and we have three planes that our body moves through. We move through the sagittal plane, the frontal plane and the transverse plane. So in looking here, the sagittal plane divides the body into right and left halves. You can see the sagittal plane coming through here. The frontal plane divides the body into front and back and the transverse plane divides the body into top and bottom. So when we're referring to movements, we always say movements occur through a plane. So for instance, moving the shoulder, performing what we call shoulder abduction, which is movement of the shoulder away from the midline of the body where you elevate the arm. That would be movement that takes place in the frontal plane, okay? Um, if we're referring to shoulder flexion, where we bring the arm straight up, that would occur in the sagittal plane. If we do shoulder rotation, that occurs in the transverse plane, okay? Um, all, pretty much all your rotational movements will occur in the transverse plane. So as we go through and we look at movements, which um, you know we spend a good deal of time looking at the movements, keep in mind what plane they would go through, okay? So that's a really important thing. Um, and again, ab, you know, for instance, when I mentioned abduction of the shoulder, so for instance, abduction at the hip would also be in the frontal plane. Flexion of the hip would also be in the sagittal plane as well, um, as would extension. So, uh, so again, as we're going through the movements later on in the discussion, keep in mind what plane, always be thinking what plane would that be taking place in, okay? Uh, we look at directions and positions. Again, this is going to be important for you know, for communication purposes. So obviously you could hear referring to superior, inferior, okay? So the, the superior uh, direction, inferior di direction. So superior going up towards the head, inferior going towards the, going towards the feet. Now, similar to that, but, but getting, um, you know, a little more specific uh, to a smaller part of the body, you have the terms crani cranial and caudal. So cranial refers to closer to the head, caudal refers to closer to the buttocks. And what usually when you're utilizing that, you're referring to structures relative to the trunk, okay? So for instance, you would say the, the umbilicus is caudal to the clavicle, okay? The clavicle are cranial to the umbilicus, okay? So when you're referring to kind of, 
areas along the trunk is typically when you'd use caudal and cranial. Um, you, you would still be able to use superior and inferior kind of interchangeably with that because, again, all they refer to is closer to the head and closer to the feet. But um, if you hear the terms cranial and caudal, they're usually doing that relative to the relative to the trunk. Okay, so some other directions in position. So anterior and posterior. Anterior refers to more of the front of the body. Posterior refers to the back of the body. When we look at medial and lateral, you see it's relative to the midline of the body. So the midline, the midline would divide the body into right and left halves. Medial refers to getting closer to the midline. Lateral refers to moving further away from the midline. Okay, superficial and deep. Okay, so superficial describes a structure closer to the body surface. Deep refers to something that's deeper. Okay, so that you'd be looking. So if we come over, you know, we come over here and look at this example with the with the muscles. Okay, the pectoralis major muscle is superficial to the ribs. So in other words, when you push on this pectoral area of the body, pectoral region of the body, you can feel the pectoralis major muscle right away. In order to palpate the ribs, you would have to do a much deeper, you know, harder pressure with palpation in order to do that. Okay. Then you have the terms uh, distal and proximal. Okay. Distal refers to farther away from the trunk or the body's midline. Proximal designates a structure closer to the trunk. Okay. And they, they show examples here. You see that the, um, the wrist would be distal to the elbow. The elbow would be proximal to the wrist, okay, because the elbow is cl uh, closer to the trunk. Okay, so here we're going to look at some general movements of the body. I mean, we're obviously going to talk about them in relation to specific joints, but be thinking about how other joints will do these motions, okay? So if we look up here, starting with flexion and extension. So the movement of flexion is any time you bend a joint or bring bones closer together. Extension is when you either open up a joint or straighten a joint. And here you're seeing an example of flexion at the fingers. So think about all the joints that you can do flexion at. And flexion occurs in this is a getting back to our planes occurs in the sagittal plane. So if you flex your elbow, you extend your elbow, you flex your knee, you extend your knee, all of that occurs in the sagittal plane. If we come over here, we have the movements of adduction, abduction. Adduction is movement towards the midline abduction is movement away from the midline and here you see that occurring at the hips so another area where you could do that is at the shoulder you can adduct and abduct the shoulder so think about what what plane so i'll give you a minute a little little bit to think about it what plane does that occur in so if you said the frontal plane you're correct okay it occurs in the frontal plane if we come down here we have medial rotation also known as internal rotation and lateral rotation, also known as external rotation, okay? So medial rotation, you're gonna be moving the limb towards the midline. Lateral rotation, you're gonna be moving away. And again, make sure you also note the other terminology. So medial and internal rotation are the same thing. Lateral and external rotation are the same thing. Now, when we talk about just general rotation, okay? So Rotation only refers to the axial skeleton. So in other words, we, we don't have, when we have rotation of the spine, as you see here, you don't have medial and lateral rotation because nothing's moving towards or away, it's just rotating. So when you rotate, for instance, the different parts of the spine, whether it's maybe just at the cervical spine or the lumbar spine, then you're talking just the movement of rotation, okay? And remember, rotation occurs in the transverse plane, okay? So you get a medial and lateral rotation at the shoulder. You could also do medial and lateral rotation at the hip. But just remember, whenever you're talking the axial skeleton, specifically in regards to movement at the head and vertebral column, you're just strictly talking at that point about rotation. So here are some other uh, different types of movements that you would see. So the, the movement of shoulder circumduction, um, shoulder circumduction or any time you circumduct a joint, um, and really the only, um, the only joint circumduction is really possible is the shoulder and hip joint. Now circumduction is a circular motion. It's a combination of motion. It's a combination of flexion, extension, ab, and adduction. So this creates kind of like a cone-shaped motion, if you will. 
Um, you have lateral flexion of the neck, okay? So the neck laterally flexes. So when the neck flexes to one side versus the other. So these are kind of like some unique movements. Again, this is something that only occurs at the axial skeleton. So you could, you could also laterally flex the trunk as well. Um, and the, the other parts of the spine will contribute to that motion. Here you have elevation of the scapula. Um, it's also showing the motion of depression. Now you could depress the scapula. Here they're showing depression of the mandible. Over here, you have supination. There's also uh, pronation. That's something particular to the forearm. So when you turn the palm up, that's known as supination. Turn it down, that's known as pronation, okay? And you'll see when we talk about the forearm, how the, the, el how the, uh, the radius and the ulna, the two bones in the forearm, how all of those, um, how those two bones interact to create that motion. And again, as you're looking at these different illustrations, if I'm sh anytime I'm showing you illustrations, particularly in this chapter, um, again, make sure you're going back, looking at your book and, and understanding all of the movements. Okay, so some other um, kind of unique motions that occur. If we're looking here at the ankles, you have the mo motion of inversion where the ankle kind of turns in, so kind of elevates the foot medial side and brings the sole of the foot medially. Here you have eversion, where it turns out, okay? Um, down here at the ankle, you have what's called plantar flexion, where the toes kind of point down, the ankle kind of points down. Here you have, when, when it comes up, that's known as dorsiflexion, okay? So, those, so again, these are unique um, motions that occur. So you don't you know, you'll hear people just talk about, you know, ankle flexion and extension. Well, essentially ankle flexion extension is also known as plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, okay? Um, over here, you're seeing the motions of protraction and retraction at the mandible. So the mandible protracts, it means it's kind of pushes out, retracts, it comes back too. You could also laterally deviate the mandible and something unique that occurs at the, um, at the hand is what's known as opposition. So opposition occurs at the carpo metacarpal joint of the thumb, and it's basically when the thumb uh, pad comes towards the um, the last finger, okay, kind of touches each other. Up here, kind of an important thing to kind of look at, and again, gets more at terminology. So supine means lying on your back face up. Prone is to lie on the table face down, and side lying is when you're doing that, when you're lying on your side. Okay, so now here we're gonna actually look at each of the individual joints. Now, as we move along in the, uh, in the course, we're obviously gonna be looking at all the muscles and how these actions occur. For now, I'm just concerned that you at least know the motion. So you should come out of this at least knowing the motions that occur. You should also know what planes the motions occur in, okay? So as you're looking at all these, I'm not gonna go through the plane for every single one of them, but be thinking about, okay, this is the active part of this. So when you're watching these videos, you're watching these still to be active, you should be thinking about looking at all these, even if you have to pause the screen. Pause the screen, look at all the motions. Can you name all the planes that those motions occur in? So you look at the spine and the thorax, you have the motion of flexion, extension, rotation, and lateral flexion. So remember, Straight rotation and lateral flexion is only going to occur at the axial spine or, or at the axial skeleton at the spine. So when you hear of rotation at all the other joints, you're always going to hear medial and lateral or internal and external rotation. Okay. Again, lateral flexion is also something unique to the, the, the spine as well. Okay. And again, you can look down here at the cervical spine and those motions associated with that region. So here's the ribs and the thorax. Now, it's some, obviously the ribs have to be able to move most, most importantly for the purpose of breathing. So you have elevation and expansion as you take air in and you have depression and collapse as air moves out. And when we get into the uh, spine, we'll also be talking about the, the muscles and, and what's involved in the muscular action at the ribs and thorax. Okay, we look at the scapula. We have the movements of scapular elevation, 
we have adduction, also known as retraction, when the scapula moves towards the spine. We have abduction or protraction as the scapula moves away from the spine. You have depression, and then you also have upward and downward rotation. Okay. So, and the pictures here give pretty good demonstrations as to what, um, you know, what movements would basically be kind of encouraging that. So, for instance, if we look over here, um, just a basic strengthening movement for kind of the upper middle trap is a, is a, you know, a shrugging exercise with weights. So, the shrugging motion or elevation of the scapula would work those, those particular muscles. Okay, we get to the, the shoulder, most specifically the glenohumeral joint, okay? We have the motions of flexion and extension, add an abduction, medial and lateral rotation, also known as internal and external rotation. Then at the shoulder, we also have something called horizontal adduction and horizontal abduction, okay? Now again, horizon so the horizontal ab adduction and horizontal abduction require that the arm be in a very specific position. So <clears throat> if you look here, there has to be a degree of elevation of the arm. So horizontal abduction is when the arm would move out to the side in that fashion, and horizontal adduction is when it would be added back in. You know, so it's still movement towards the midline. So in order for this to take place though, the shoulder would have to be, you know, elevated, okay, and then you would be able to perform those motions. So, sort of similar to circumduction, it actually does involve more than one motion because it, it, it involves a specific position for the, the shoulder to be in in order to carry out that movement. So, the elbow and forearm, uh, elbow is pretty simple with the hinge joint, you have flexion and extension. And then we are, already talked about supination and pronation of the forearm. So, and again, that occurs at the proximal and distal radial ulnar joint. So the movement of supination or turning the palm up and pronation rotating the forearm down. We look at the wrist. Okay, so the wrist can do flexion and extension. It also does either adduction or abduction. We also, when in referring to the wrist, we refer to adduction as ulnar deviation and abduction as radial deviation. And the reason why we do that, when you do that motion, the hand moves in the case of adduction, it moves closer to the ulnar side of the wrist. And when you do abduction, it moves closer to the radial side. And the reason why you look at the wrist in that way is when you're in the anatomical position where your, your hands are down at your side and your palms are facing forward, if you, if you adduct or, or just move the wrist towards the ulna, you are essentially moving the hand towards the midline and then moving it away from the midline with, uh, with radial deviation. So we look at the thumb. Uh, very important at the thumb, this sometimes gets a little confusing. So movement at the thumb involves both the first carpal metacarpal and the metacarpal phalangeal joints. So the metacarpal phalangeal joint, when you're looking at the thumb, is right here. Okay, it's the it's where the this is the where the metacarpal bone would be. And this is the first phalanx of the thumb. So that's the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And then the carpal metacarpal joint is down in here. Um, where the carpal, uh, where the metacarpal bone articulates with the carpal bone at the wrist. So there, there's a combination. These these movements occur at both of these joints. Um, some it, you know, some occur more at one joint versus the other, and, and we'll get more into that once we get into the talking about the wrist and hand. So flexion and extension, opposition we talked about. So here's adduction and abduction. So a lot of times, believe it or not, and and maybe this isn't confusing, but sometimes students do get confused with differentiating at the thumb between flexion and extension versus add and abduction. So abduction is when the thumb is just getting taken away from the midline. So here's your hand's midline. Your hand has its own midline. When the thumb just kind of moves away, that's abduction. When the thumb moves towards, that's adduction. Flexion and extension, you can see clearly here how that's happening, okay? And then down here we have, obviously, at the rest of the fingers, that's going to occur at the metacarpal phalangeal and the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. Here we have the mandible or at the jaw. So elevation and depression, protraction, retraction, and lateral deviation. We have motions that occur at the pelvis. Okay, so this is kind of a unique area too. So referring to the pelvis, we're referring to this down here. 
We have your two inanimate bones, which is made, which are actually made up of three different bones in the sacrum and their articulations. Um, anterior tilt, okay, or downward rotation is when the pelvis kind of tilts forward. Posterior tilt or upward rotation is when the pelvis tilts back, and then you have what's called lateral tilt, okay, where it just tilts laterally. Okay, coming to the hip. Okay, again, the hip will also have um, some, some different degrees, freedom of motion if we look at it. So we have flexion and extension, add an abduction, and then medial and lateral rotation at the hip. Again, so here, we'll take a few seconds here and see if you could tell me what planes these motions occur in. Take a little bit of time, think about it for a second. <clears throat> So flexion extension, sagittal plane, abduction and adduction, frontal plane, medial and lateral rotation, transverse plane. So if you had that, you, you were correct with your planes of motion. Then we have the knee. Now the knee's kind of um, the knee's kind of interesting. So the knee's primary motions are flexion and extension. Now the knee, well, we're gonna get into joint classifications later. The knee is considered a hinge joint, but it's considered a modified hinge joint because there is some rotation that can take place at the knee. Now, the trick is with the knee, the knee can only rotate when it's flexed. When the knee is fully extended, there, there is no rotation that takes place at the knee. So the lower leg, can actually rotate or would essentially be rotation of the knee, but it could only do it when the joint is flexed. When the joint is completely extended, the knee locks. And then at that point, the only way you could kind of turn the lower leg in and out, if you will, is if the, is if you basically rotate at the hip. So if you're, you know, if you're straightening out your knee and you're saying, well, look, I can rotate, you know, you're, you're not rotating at the knee at that point your hips actually creating the rotation in order to in order to do that. Again, ankle, foot, and toes, we had talked about this already. So you have all of your different joints. Again, make note of that. Again, obviously we're gonna get more in depth, but you know, make note of the joints there. Again, you have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, inversion and eversion, and then they're showing you toe motion as well. So now looking at just the systems of the body. So again, you know, talking in general, just again, so you can get some terminology and just kind of understand regions. So we have the systems of the body. We have the skeletal system. So this is obviously the, the bones basically linked together to form the skeleton. And the skeleton is essentially broken down into two, two body part areas. You have what's called the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. In the picture, you see the axial skeleton is highlighted. The axial skeleton includes the cranium, the vertebral column or the spine, the ribs, the sternum, and the hyoid bone. Okay, so you could see all of those kind of darkened in and highlighted there. Okay, and again, make note of the other bones. So again, you're, you're kind of starting to get your, your general location of the different bones of the body. Okay, so here you're looking at the, you know, the sacrum, the coccyx, which is the tailbone. Again, that's all going to be uh, part of that axial skeleton. Okay, coming up, you have the vertebrae, you have the ribs. Here's your sternum. Okay, and then you can see the different parts of the, the skull along with the, the mandible. And we have the appendicular skeleton. So the appendicular skeleton refers to the appendages. Okay, so it's basically everything in the arms and legs, including the pectoral girdle, which includes the scapula and clavicle, and the pelvic girdle, or the hips. So you look here, you can see those areas, all the areas highlighted with the, I guess that would be a reddish tint or brownish tint. Um, you can see all of those kind of highlighted. That would be your appendicular skeleton. Now we're going to look at types of joints. So if you notice, as we went through all of the, 
kind of general joint motions. You notice that some joints moved more than others. Some joints had certain um, basic, you know, essentially restrictions. So again, depending upon the joint function, and you'll see there are examples here of different types of joints. So if you look here, initially you have what's called a ball and socket joint, okay? And they're showing you a ball and socket joint here. That's the glenohumeral joint, okay? Over here, they're kind of showing you sort of a representation of, in general, what that type of joint is shaped like. It's obviously not an anatomical model, but you get to kind of see. And basically what a ball and socket joint is, is it's kind of a, a spherical surface of one bone kind of fits into a depression. Um, and basically, joints that are ball and socket joints can move in every plane, okay? So the shoulder is an example of one. So see if you can think, I'm not gonna give you, give you the answer, but think of maybe another joint that would be considered a ball and socket joint, okay? Over here, we have what's called an ellipsoid joint, okay? An ellipsoid joint is when you have an oval-shaped end of a bone articulating in an elliptical basin or depression in another, okay? And they're showing you here the, the wrist joint is an example of an ellipsoid joint, okay? Um, so, and the re and so what's unique about this is the wrist can move into flexion and extension and also ab and adduction. Okay. So think of, again, think of another joint that works that way. Over here, we have what's called a hinge joint. Okay. And the hinge joint is, you know, example of a hinge joint is an elbow. Okay. It's set up just like a hinge and all a hinge joint could essentially do is flexion and extension. Okay. With, there's one exception to this rule is the knee joint, which is known as a modified hinge joint. So the knee joint is still considered a hinge joint. The reason why the knee joint is still considered a hinge joint is because it could really only move, remember, as we said, freely through flexion and extension. While the lower leg, or you can do rotation at the knee, remember the caveat is that the knee has to be flexed, okay? Once the knee is fully extended, rotation no longer takes place. If we come down here, you have what's called the saddle joint. So a saddle joint, um, now in your book, they call it a modified ellipsoid joint, but a saddle joint is when you have what are called convex and concave surfaces on both sides. So they kind of look like a saddle, looks like two saddles on top of one another. So if you look at a horse saddle, a horse saddle is kind of, you know, if you look just down here, shaped like this, was well, basically like taking a horse saddle, turning another one upside down and putting it on top, okay? Um, the first metacarpal, um, the first metacarpal bones form the example of a saddle joint. So when you look at the carpal metacarpal bone joint at the thumb, that's a saddle joint. Okay, and again, you have the convex and concave surfaces. So if you look here, so when I'm referring to convex and concave, so the ball and socket joint, you only have a convex surface here. You have a concave surface or the, the surface with the depression here. And you have that with all of these, okay? So you always have one concave and one convex surface. Over here, you have it on both sides and they kind of fit together like, again, kind of putting two saddles together. A gliding joint is when you have kind of two flat surfaces and there's a bunch of different um, gliding joints in the body here. What they're showing you is at the, it's not the wrist joint, it's, there, there's one by the wrist joint. It's basically all of the, what we call the intercarpal joints. So all the little joints, we have all these carpal bones um, inside our wrist, okay? Those are all representative of little joints and they're basically just gliding joints, okay? And then over here we have what's called the pivot joint. So what that does is allows one bone to rotate around the surface of another. So here we're looking at the atlantoaxial joint, okay? The joint between the atlas and the axis, the first two vertebrae at the cervical spine which is responsible for creating um, rotation at the cervical spine. So as we go through this, think about some other joints, okay, and what they might get classified as, okay? Again, look anatomically what they look like and also look at what motions they do and both of those things will kind of tell you what type of joints you have. Okay, here we look at the muscular system. So again, you can look at um, here you can start to get an idea where certain muscles have their general location and what they do, okay? Um, here you're seeing the, the, the muscles on the anterior surface of the body getting highlighted uh, throughout here. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, 
But, you know, take your time, look at this illustration in your text and just note kind of some of your general locations that we're, we're going to be looking at for muscles. Again, the more you're kind of exposed to anatomical illustrations and pictures, the easier it gets to remember where they are. Okay, here's the muscles on the posterior side of the body. Okay, and again, location kind of tells you what they're going to do. So, you know, for instance, just as an example, we come back here to the back of the thigh. We have here, you know, one of the parts of the biceps femoris or one of the muscles of the hamstring. Okay, here's the semimembranosus, which is another hamstring muscle. So just think to yourself, what, what's one action that the hamstring does? Okay, so, you know, when you, could, when you bend your knee or flex your knee, one of the motions that occurs is, is knee flexion that's created by the hamstrings. Okay, so again, if you think kind of location, it starts to give you ideas as far as what the, the muscles actually do. And again, just kind of navigating the body. So just kind of looking at some other structures and, and you know, it, it's good to kind of make yourself aware. So here I'm just showing you the tendon. So a tendon is essentially what attaches muscle to bone. Okay, and tendons are all shaped very differently just depending upon the shape of the muscle. Uh, and what the muscle essentially, the, the actions that the muscle essentially performs. Here you have a ligament. So a ligament attaches one bone to another bone. Okay, so a ligament isn't actively, isn't an actively contractile tissue. So in other words, muscle actively contracts. Ligaments are just basically there to support a, a joint, okay, provide stability to the joint. So here you're looking at the deltoid ligament on the medial side of the ankle. So right on the inside of your ankle, um, you can you can actually feel this on yourself. You can feel these ligaments on the the inside of the ankle joint. Okay, and that's to provide that medial stability to the ankle. Then we have fascia. So fascia is basically a soft tissue structure that kind of covers, kind of envelops our whole body essentially. Okay, you'll hear a lot of people refer to fascia as the saran wrap of the body. And we have two different types. We have the superficial fascia, which you see here which is directly underneath the skin, kind of covers also the adipose tissue. And then you have the deep fascia, which kind of covers the muscle. And it also has, if you look, you can also see deep fascia um, in the case when you're, when you're talking multiple muscles kind of in a compartment, they, the deep fascia will also kind of envelop all those individual muscles. So this is basically a cross section of the forearm. You can see that up here. Again, always when you're looking at all of these illustrations in any lecture or your textbook, orientate yourself to what you're looking at. So you're basically looking at a cross section of the forearm, okay? So these are all the different muscles in the forearm and you can see how the both deep and superficial fascia kind of lines those muscles. Then you have your retinaculum. So what a retinaculum does is kind of hold tissue down Okay, and it's like a ligamentous type structure. That's it, it's probably closest, you know, probably closely represents a ligament. But basically, what it does is kind of hold a lot of times tissues down. So the retinaculum that come across the ankle. So the whole purpose of that is to kind of keep these tendons kind of tethered down. Okay, so this retinaculum kind of comes along and just provides stability so that all of these muscles work efficiently and perform the motions that they need to. Then you have something called bursa. So what bursa are, they're basically little fluid filled sacs, particularly around regions where there's friction and they kind of reduce friction in that area. So they could be, you know, in the case here, we're looking at the bursa around the knee. So here you have bursa in between the patella or what you think of as your kneecap um, and the skin. You have bursa down here. So you can see there's bursa that goes between like tendon uh, or between the bone and the skin. You have um, bursa that lies between tendon and bone. You have a bunch of these throughout your body. Here they're just showing a couple of them at the knee, but basically they reduce friction. And you really, you know, when they're, they're not inflamed, you can't really, uh, you mean, you could obviously palpate them, but they don't feel like much. When they get inflamed, they could get very swollen, particularly if they're superficial. So if you get somebody that gets a, um, like a pre -pertellar. this is the pre -pertellar bursa. So if someone gets a pre uh, bursitis, this really swells up and, and it, really, um, it really becomes noticeable. 
So and these are your objectives. And again, really going forward, all the objectives for the different body part regions are, are gonna be pretty self-explanatory, but here for the purposes of this talk, I figured I would list them. So make note of these. And that concludes this discussion on the general terminology.